So the, the book of Acts, that's where we're at, just uh, opening up. It's introduction today. Introductions aren't typically that exciting, but, but, but it's a necessary foundation, I think, as we continue to want to, to build and, and walk our way through this, this book, at least the initial three chapters. Uh, then we'll be uh, taking a, a break because I think what the leadership team wanted to do is we just feel that the book of Acts carries so much about what the heart of what our mission is as a church and who we're to be as the people of God that they wanted to open uh, each January then with doing a section in the book of Acts. So we'll do the first three chapters and then we'll be going into the little book of First Peter. And so uh, the book of Acts, and if you've got a take-home sheet, uh, you'll be able to see there's an outline of the, of the message on the, the back side of that, and that might help you follow. So if I start to rambling or go on a few rabbit trails, you've got at least that outline to help guide you where we're going and, and what it's about. But really, this book is going to recall for us the beginnings of the church. It's the story of the people of God, empowered really by the Spirit of God to carry out the mission that God has us where we live and work. And, and Acts ends in such a way, as we said earlier, that communicates that the story's not yet finished. It's continuing today. And so as the people of God, we're carrying out this same mission, which is why this book is so important to us, because in the book of Acts, we're going to unlock our purpose as God's people and how we're to uh, go about that. And so we hope through this series, we're going to grow in awareness of, of really even the Holy Spirit and a trust in God's Spirit and have our minds and hearts prepared to be witnesses uh, for Jesus. Now, if you're a guest here and not a professing Christian, I know your worst fears have been confirmed a little bit because you're thinking we're trying to convert you. But actually, in reality, though we do have a heart desire, we'd love to see that, yet we can't convert you. And that's something you probably, you already know, but now at least you know that we know. And, uh, and we don't actually see that as our job. Because we can't change a single heart. We can't change your heart. We can't make you do something you don't want to do. But what we do see as our role is that we want to make sure that um, you accurately know who Jesus is and what it is he has done. We want you to have the accurate facts. We don't want you to have opinions or tradition. And, and I'm just hopeful enough to believe that if you truly behold Jesus as he is in truth, he'll impress you. He'll amaze you. And you'll actually want to know him with no one forcing you into anything because that's what's happened to me. So this is a book that's going to help us take a close look at Jesus and what Christianity is all about in its purest version. Now, not everything that calls itself Christian is. And not uh, everything that professing Christians claim that God says or the Bible says is actually accurate. And that's why we are always encouraging you to check out the Bible for yourself. In fact, if you don't have a Bible, um, I don't know if there's one left on the table or not, but uh, if there is, we'd love for you to just take a, a, a Bible there. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to just take that Bible and just, it's yours, keep it. It's a gift from us to you. We'd love for you to be able to, to read uh, both the book of Acts and its first volume, Luke, which we'll, we'll see in just a, a moment. And so we want you to see for yourselves, to follow along so that you're not just trusting me um, or whoever's teaching, but you need to be convinced that this is what God himself actually has declared uh, really in his message to you. Now in your Bible, it might actually be, you might have a little title, it might be titled and said, The Acts of the Apostles. Now, that's a, a man-given title that was added much afterwards just to our English translations. But I think that title actually falls a little bit short. Because as this book, uh, as we walk our way through it, I think you'll see that it really unfolds the acts of God. It's because acts is going to explain what God is doing as opposed to ultimately the, the acts of the apostles. Though there is a partnership because we, we've seen always that's what God loves to do. He loves to partner with us. He could do it way more efficiently and better himself. But he involves us as weak and broken as we are. So we could call it the acts of God. Or maybe even better, we could call it the acts of Jesus as he builds his church. Or we could call it the acts of the Holy Spirit, who is referred to even in this book as the Spirit of Jesus. 
And so the Spirit, of course, was sent them by Jesus to empower the church. And so, which also means we could call it the acts of the church, right? Because partnering with the Spirit and Jesus, really to continue Jesus' mission, his kingdom advance. So why don't we just call it the book of Acts, okay? And we can encompass all of those, okay? So as we work through this book, we're going to see that Jesus is not really interested in attenders or spectators. He's actually calling people to be his disciples. And that means the people who are involved, partnering with the Spirit in um, the church that Jesus is building. Now, I'm not sure what images come to your mind when you hear the word church. But it may not be exactly how they understood it in the first century. Because the church at its inception, as we tried to show in the video in the very beginning, is essentially a movement. It's a movement built around conviction that Jesus had died as the only Savior of sinners and that he physically had risen physically from the dead, proving that he was who he said he was. And that he was the rightful Lord of the earth and all people everywhere were now commanded to repent and invited to come home to him. But over the years, a terrible thing happened. People began to think of church as a place that you went to for religious services. And that shift in thinking really changed the fundamental way that people actually related to the church. Throughout the, the dark and middle ages, uh, church for many became to be seen as simply a place that you attended or an event that you sat through rather than a movement that you were a part of. And so the church ended up becoming an institution that essentially just provided services and programs for people, often controlled by powerful people who used it to serve their own interests. And so we want this series to take us back to the Bible to see what we're called to be as Jesus' church on his mission. So when we come to this book, I want you to, to try to Set aside some of your preconceived notions and let's discover together who we are to be and, and what acts that we are to be about as we partner with the acts of the Spirit in the footsteps of the acts of the apostles. Because the danger of the church in every age is to cease being a movement and instead just become a ministry that provides services to people or even worse, uh, a place people simply attend. Movements move. And so if you're part of the movement, you're moving, led by the Spirit. So in this book, we're, book then, we're going to see the beginnings of the church, and it's going to advance without buildings, without seminaries or trained professionals, without programs, no youth groups, no children's ministries. It was as if the focused program they had was to have people fall in love with Jesus and his gospel and then live their lives accordingly. So let's have the scripture video that will introduce the, the first few verses of chapter 1. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we started out. We should have a contest, which intern's voice was on the video, you know, so we get to know our interns even that way too. But Acts chapter 1 then, so he starts out in the first book. So what is that right away, in the first book? Well, the first book is the gospel according to Luke, or the book of Luke that he had written. So if you have your New Testament, you'll have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, and then Acts. But actually, Luke, that third book, was the, is the first book that Luke is referring to. So Luke and the book of Acts are actually a two-volume set by the same author. And so we, we learn that the book of Acts is then is the sequel to the book of Luke. Now, who was Luke? Well, he was, a, he was a physician, he was a doctor, he was a Gentile, a Gentile doctor. In fact, he was a Syrian. 
a former outsider whose life was changed by Jesus, and then he became this careful, meticulous, orderly transcriber of the life of Jesus and the church. And in fact, as we continue on through the book of Acts, we're going to see by the time you reach chapter 16, the language changes from they to we. Because from chapter 16 on, we're going to see that that the doctor, Luke, he was actually traveling with Paul, and so he was there as a part of it. And so you'll see the, the we language that, that begins. So he traveled with Paul as part of his church planning team. Uh, Luke came to faith in Antioch in Syria, and that was the church where Paul had then uh, served as, a, as an elder, as one of the pastors there. And that was the church, Antioch, that had sent Paul as a part of a team and, and other teams as well on this church planting missions. So Luke writes this book as a historian, really as an investigative reporter. And we're, we're, you see that also in the volume one of Luke chapter one. And if you flip there or maybe on the screen, so Luke chapter one, the first four verses, he, even as he introduces it, you'll see that he's writing to Theophilus, the same individual. But he, he talks about carefully investigating. He interviews eyewitnesses. He investigates their claims. He never relies on a single eyewitness, but he actually researches, always comparing his sources to establish the certainty of every event that he records. So you know if Luke records it, it's not embellished legend. In fact, the book of Luke and Acts were written before 60 AD, so that means it's within that first generation after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and so the, it's so close enough that those accounts and the eyewitness accounts could always be verified. In fact, there's a, a picture I just want to show you of P8, which is Papyrus 8. This is a, one of the earlier fragments uh, found here just in the... the probably within 50 to 60 years, this copy of this one from Museum of Berlin, um, of a section then of the, of the Book of Acts, just to show you that, that it was written very early on. And also I wanted to remind us by this that we're talking history. We're not just talking philosophy or ideas. And so when he writes into this, this book, then he, he begins to write this he, to O Theophilus. So who's that? Well, Theophilus is a, is a skeptic. Uh, that he's writing these two books for, and really through him, all other skeptics, you know, who are loved by God and, and hopefully can become lovers of God, because that's what the meaning of Theophilus is. It means God loved or God lover, and so you, you have this as well. So in writing to this, this skeptic, so he can be certain of all the events that he's been hearing about and what's actually true, what's, what's factual. And then he says, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, referring to his first book, Luke. And so if these events have not been carefully confirmed by Luke, as he said, then he's a liar. And he gave up his life and he died for that lie. And if he lied, it would have easily been easy to expose the things that were untrue because at the time he wrote it, the eyewitnesses were still alive to be able to affirm or deny what he says. So as we begin this journey, though, I want you to get the sense that we're actually reaching across time and grabbing hands with people who have left an honest record, including their failures and mistakes, to remind us who we are. And so it's in this first book of Luke that he starts out referring to that it's here he, he told him about what all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. So when you see the word began, it implies continuation. So it's not that the gospel of Luke, you have Jesus working and now in Acts the church works, but rather Jesus worked through and in and through his fleshly body in Luke and now Jesus works through his body, the church, in Acts. So he's invited the church not to do it for him, but actually he invites us to join him as he does his work through us. And that's why Jesus is going to tell him, you're going to have to wait in verse 4. He says this, because you're going to need the empowering of the Spirit of God for this. And so Luke wants the church to know who we are, what our mission is in this gathering time before Jesus returns. And so that's why you begin to see that that. Acts really articulates the second phase of Jesus' kingdom ministry. Phase one of the kingdom was the gospel of Luke. That's with Jesus coming himself in human flesh 
And that was until, as you see in verse 2, until the day he was taken up, right? That's his ascension then to the right hand of the Father as King of kings, Lord of lords. But now in the book of Acts, he's going to unfold phase 2 where Jesus is working from heaven through the Spirit, empowering the church to continue Jesus' mission. That's our partnership, right? And so that's why I love the name of our global network, Acts 29, because the story is continuing. It's just continuing the story. And then the third phase of the kingdom we won't talk about today, but that's coming next week, and you'll see that in verse 11, and that's the third phase of the kingdom, and that begins when Jesus returns. He's coming back, and we'll see that, and we'll talk about that next week. So, all the things that Jesus began to do is what he talked about in the book of Luke. Now, what was it that Jesus did in that first phase of the kingdom? And verse 3 answers that. It says, after his What's the next word? His suffering. After his suffering, he came to suffer. The essence of Christianity is not about what you do or your performance, but it's about what Christ did. Jesus' suffering finds its climax on the cross. The whole cornerstone of this kingdom was laid down when Jesus laid down his life. Now, why did he suffer? Well, because of our failure, right? Our wrongness, our sin, our rebellion in seeking and trying to live for our own kingdom of self as opposed to bowing the knee to the Lord Jesus. Justice then comes in with guns pointing right towards us, and in comes Jesus. He stands between with arms outstretched, and he takes all the guns of justice. Right? He suffers. He swallows the bitter pill of justice, taking all the wrath that we deserved. Jesus suffered for you because he cares for you. He went to the cross, as which is the most radical, disturbing, and freeing message. I mean, the cross declares you're a total mess and you're totally loved. Right? You're so sinful and broken that Jesus had to die for you. It took the Son of God himself sacrificing his life in order to rescue you. So that solves our pride problem, which is the biggest problem we have in this church and in this city. But the cross crushes our pride because it says that Jesus had to be condemned because that's what we rightly deserved. And the cross also declares that we're totally loved. Loved by Jesus to the extent that he laid down his life for you. And that solves our insecurity problem because we all have some insecurity issues. But to know Jesus knows absolutely everything about us and he loves us completely, ah, Pride is crushed, insecurity is washed away in his eternal love based on what Jesus has done, his suffering. And as we walk through Acts, we're going to see that, that people don't have to go through an obstacle course to get into a relationship with Jesus, to know the living God. There's no prerequisites to attain to, you just repent. A sweet word. No great feat, just stop resisting. Surrender to him. Forsake your own rule, being your own God, and entrust your life and eternity to him. Now, because of what Jesus did on the cross, conquering sin, death, and hell in resurrection power, the message of grace then can go through, uh, and, and justice as well, can go through um, to sinners. Through the Holy Spirit, he says in verse 2, to the apostles whom he had chosen. So Jesus chose them. Jesus chose, first of all, very ordinary people for this mission. Tax collectors, fishermen, just ordinary people. And the word apostles actually just means sent ones. Sent, sent out on a mission. So they're not super disciples, but they're just ordinary, broken people, just like you and me. But these apostles would be the ones through whom he would miraculously work and communicate. He'd lay down the foundational New Testament teaching. And so in verse 3, we see that, that they really now have eyes to, to see and ears to hear after Jesus had risen from the dead. And he spent 40 days, we learn, with the disciples. And he's loving them and equipping them and he's teaching them about what? The kingdom of God. See that in verse 3? So the focus was the kingdom of God. And, and that, that it has, first of all, come in Jesus and his establishing the church. And as we shall see, that this phase of the kingdom is a time of gathering, 
A time of gathering of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation into this forever kingdom. And then, after his ascension, 10 days later, he would pour out his spirit to empower them for this mission to which he's called them. And that's why in verse 3, it says, Jesus presented himself to them after his death by many convincing proofs, is what that phrase, word actually means, convincing proofs. And he had to prove that he really was alive. Because you see, these guys were not naive, uh, primitive guys who just gullibly believed everything. They were skeptics. It took miraculous, undeniable evidence before they'd believe. Remember Thomas? Thus I see who is in his hands feet, I will not believe. And so you've got the skeptics because they, they just figured this can't be, right? has to be a hoax because people don't rise from the dead. But that's what makes this eyewitness account so significant. Because if someone made the astounding claims that Jesus made, that he was God, and he said the chief sign of that truth would be his resurrection, and then you see and touch him alive, I mean, you can't just dismiss this news. All of Jesus' claims are confirmed through his resurrection because no one beats death except for Jesus. He beat death. He died, he was buried, and he rose. And he appeared over a period of 40 days, including having breakfast with people. I mean, think about it. A guy dies, you go to his gravesite to leave flowers, you realize it's open, he's not there, where is he? Oh, he's in town having breakfast. So you, you go have breakfast with him, you see the scars, you, you eat with him, you, 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 you touch him, you hug him, you, you have that, you see the scars, it's very convincing proof. I mean, you don't even have to go to college to get that one right. It's, it's there. And so we have this. Now, and then, even this, included in the first group of eyewitnesses were his brothers and sisters. We're going to see them coming up in a later message in verse 14. You'll see that, that they're there now. Now, what would it take for you to worship your brother as Lord of the whole universe? I'm thinking it would take a lot. It's going to take a lot. At least a death, burial, and a resurrection, right? Right? physically resur resurrected. Now, if you don't accept that, if you don't accept the testimony of these eyewitnesses, then you need some other alternative, plausible explanation for why his own family members, why they shifted their thinking from, from thinking their brother is a little crazy with his claims. Because you've got to remember, his brothers and sisters were total skeptics. And as soon as the messianic claims started to be heralded around their brother, they totally distanced themselves from that. To now, they're worshiping him as their Lord and their God. So you say, I don't believe in the resurrection. Well, fine, but then you've got to have some alternative explanation to the whole birth and expansion of the Christian church. Because this is something that's actually happened in history. We Christians were here. We're all around the world. It's absolutely unprecedented. And there in those early stages, you've got overnight worldview change in hundreds of rational people not predisposed to this sort of thing, not predisposed to Christianity, and they're claiming, we saw him. We saw him. And then they're willing to even die for it. So you explain it. Do you have a better explanation that both fits with the historical evidence and explains what has happened? See, in his suffering on the cross and in his resurrection, Jesus accomplished what only he could do. And what he purposed to do next, he wouldn't do through just one human body, but through the Holy Spirit in millions of human bodies in community. His power would radiate from the throne of God into the whole world through us. So let's give up our small ambitions. Let's repent for our low expectations and let's expect God to act. In verse 4 and 5, Jesus now shifts that focus to phase 2 of his kingdom. So he reminds him first, Luke told you about phase 1. 
Jesus, his coming to die for us on the cross, his conquering sin, death, Satan, and hell, his ascending now as Lord of Lords, King of all kings, but now pouring out his spirit, here comes phase two of this kingdom, which is what the book of Acts is all about. And all of this, the spirit of God has been sent and poured out on the people of God for Jesus' mission. It's not just so you can be a better person and achieve your potential. It's not so you could showcase your glory to the world. This is exclusively for the mission and fame of Jesus, as Becky reminded us of, right? And that's what we are going to see in the upcoming verses. Jesus is the head of the church. Every church belongs to him. Every church has the same mission. We don't have the right to come up with our own mission and try to use Jesus or God for our mission. Our mission is simply to do what Jesus told us to do, the mission he gives us. That's why we talk about making disciples, planting churches, because that's Jesus' mission. And we're to bear witness to Jesus in community. The more we work together, the more we pray together, the more we walk in unity and humility and in generosity and in love, the more disciples are made. And the more churches are planted and the more Jesus' kingdom advances. And the more the Holy Spirit pours out grace and blessing. The Holy Spirit wants you and me to become like Jesus together in community and to continue the ministry of Jesus. And I also want us to notice in this passage that before Jesus actually sent the Spirit to empower their witness, which we're going to see is going to come in chapter 2, but he actually, he trains, he taught, and he instructed the disciples in kingdom truth. And so the Bible never pits learning against power, truth against the spirit. Worship is always in spirit and in truth. And in fact, there is no spirit power apart from the truth because that's the job of the spirit who's called the spirit of truth. And he's to take the truths of Jesus and he opens our eyes and makes it vivid, glorious, and affects our hearts by it. And so he Jesus, too, just before going to the cross, he told the the apostles that the spirit of truth, he will glorify me. He'll make it all about Jesus by taking of mine and making it known to you. So the spirit gives us power by making the truth of God just shine in our hearts. We see also in Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus how He prayed that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would really just open up the eyes of their heart so they could really behold and see the wondrous grace, the incredible gospel of Jesus. He he tells them that they'd be strengthened with power through the spirit. What? So that they'd have the power actually to grasp and see how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So he wants us to know how much we've been loved by Jesus. So we get blown away by the grace that we've seen and that will empower us to hardly, we won't be able to keep quiet about him. Now you can think then of the spirit as fire and the truth of God's word as firewood. And without both wood and fire, you don't have a fire. So the Spirit takes the gospel truth, he enlightens our minds and makes it real to us. He captivates our hearts, giving us the power and love and confidence then to be his witnesses. So one of the prerequisites for dynamic mission is a deep, rich understanding of the gospel-centered scriptures, which is why I think he did what he did at the end of the book of Luke. We get a a glimpse of really uh, the apostles' training in Luke chapter 24, right at the very end of that first volume that he writes. Um, And that's where the resurrected Jesus showed them that all the Bible, he says, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms was really all about him. And so Jesus really gave them the ultimate Bible survey and showed them the interpretive key to all the scriptures, says he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And that's amazing because it can't simply mean that they just surveyed the content and just learned all the stories in a mechanical way, but rather it means they learned that every part of the Bible really points to Jesus. And Jesus showed them how to preach the gospel then out of the Old Testament scriptures there and how to call people to repentance and faith. And he, he showed them how to be witnesses to these things so that people could find forgiveness, forgiveness. 
And so you begin to see that uh, he, uh, Jesus kicks off this phase two, training them in the teaching of the, the gospel-centered scriptures. And then he tells them in verse five, still back in Acts chapter one then, that he gives them this promise that they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In fact, we're going to learn it's actually 10 days from that point in time. And when this baptism of the Holy Spirit did come, we're going to see that it didn't just fall on the apostles. It fell on all 120 that were there, all 120 Christians, because anyone bearing witness for Jesus must first receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. So my heart and desire is that the Holy Spirit would empower us to fulfill our calling as the church, to be witnesses of Jesus in this time and place for his fame and honor and for the joy of more and more people so they can come to know this incredible Savior and Lord. Do we have any questions that come up? No questions yet? Just as a reminder, there, there is a, I think both on the take-home sheet as well as up on the screen, there's usually a number of which if you want to be able to text any questions at any time you know that, that you have, you can text those in. If you don't get the questions in in time but you have, we have what's called gospel communities where, where we seek to be the church together. And there's opportunity in those smaller groups and that too to bring your questions even from, from the passage of Scripture that we're studying and you have that opportunity to, to dig into the Scripture together as well as feel free to email me with your questions and, and uh, as, as time permits, we'll, uh, I'll try to respond to those as well. But it's good to be able to, let's ask the questions, let's dig into the word together as we seek to understand Jesus' call in our life as his church. Because as we walk through this book, we're gonna just see that we just can't go on with life as normal. Because the sacrifice of Jesus, the lostness of this world, it just demands a different response. So I really hope and pray that this series through the book of Acts here is going to really impact us and really help prepare us to uh, yield ourselves to the Spirit's leading that we might be Jesus' witnesses here in this time and place.